after the session. Thank you. For optimal viewing, we also suggest that you take a moment to change your view setting to speaker view. You can find this option in the view menu at the top right corner of your screen. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our leads for today's session, Amy Getz and Bruce Vandal. Amy currently serves as a senior program associate at West Ed, where she works on mathematic path mathematics pathways and other system efforts to increase equitable student success in the transition from secondary to and through the first year of college. Amy has over 30 years of experience in mathematics education, including as a high school teacher, college faculty member, program director, and systemic change facilitator. She spent 11 years at the Charles A. Dana Center and is one of the original architects of the Dana Center Mathematics Pathways Initiative. Amy has worked with state system and institutional leaders, faculty, student, student support professionals, and researchers to implement modernized mathematics pathways in more than a dozen states. Bruce Vandal is the principal of Bruce Vandal Consulting, where he works with states, systems, institutions, and national higher education organizations to implement evidence-based college completion reforms. He is a national expert on developmental education reform and was a co-author of the first and second edition of the Core Principles for Transforming Remediation. Bruce has also worked with state and system leaders on several statewide developmental education reform initiatives. He was formerly a senior VP at Complete College America and was the VP of Development and Outreach as well as the director of the Post-Secondary Education and Workforce Development Institute at Education Commission of the States. Amy and Bruce, it is an honor to have you both with us today. I'll pass it to you to get us started. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, everybody who's joining us. Uh, as you are going to be able to tell, Bruce and I care deeply about this topic, so we are always really happy to have these discussions. So what we're hoping to achieve today is that we'll understand the potential impact of developmental education reforms, identify conditions that allow for full implementation of reforms, and identify strategies for equity-minded transformation through the reform process. Our agenda is that we'll start by with some background on the data sources for the information we're presenting. Then we'll talk about the impact. And then we'll look at the current context and momentum for reform, conditions that enable reform at scale. And then we'll end with a discussion around designing for equity-minded transformation. And just to do housekeeping details, uh, please put questions into chat. And Bruce and I are going to monitor and try to respond to those as well as we can. But we also welcome any follow-up questions via email. As Julie said, you'll get the slides after the webinar and the slide deck you'll receive will actually include a few slides that we're not going to use in the presentation just to give you a little more information. I even go on, Julie. So the reason Bruce and I are doing this particular webinar is that we did a study with the Gates for the Gates Foundation on the current context of developmental education reform in the United States. And so this is the data that is going to inform everything that we talk about today. So we had a 50 state scan of state policies, a comprehensive literature review, uh, extensive stakeholder interviews with stakeholders from a variety of roles, and we also pulled from the strong start to finish scaling site evaluation. So we wanted to start by talking a little bit about the problem that we're all here to solve. I'm sure this isn't new to you, but it makes you feel like it's important to always ground ourselves and remembering what, why we're doing this work. So back in 2006, some of the, the seminal research on developmental education came out showing that over 50% of community college students and 20% of four-year students were being placed into developmental education. And that is a problem because out of those, only 22% of the community college students were earning a college-level gateway math or English course in two years, and the rate for four-year students was only 37%. And really importantly, minoritized students were disproportionately impacted by those, uh, those structures of develop, developmental education with, uh, and, and the placement practices involved in them. So it, the table in the middle of the slide here kind of gives a breakdown of that just to help think, see through how this, this impacted different populations. So this shows that 
the rates of completion of a college gateway course, math or English, in two years. And as you can see, black students of students experiencing poverty are disproportionately impacted. And that's an even greater concern because we also know that those students are more likely to be placed into dev ed as, and as well as Latinx students more likely to be placed in. So, you know, at that time, this was pretty frustrating for the field. We thought we were doing a good job and we found out we weren't. So we dug in and tried a lot of things. But the great thing is, is we found a solution that really addressed this problem. And that was this combination of the three uh, strategies there on the right side of your screen. So combining, and it's really important that we see this as a combination, that the three work together. Uh, placement reform, which really means multiple measures that prioritize high school GPA. Acceleration into college level courses, it's uh, primarily through co-requisites and alignment of math pathways to programs of study all combined to have a huge impact. And by that, we mean that we were seeing impact of, of twice, three times uh, more student success, which is kind of an unheard of impact in most reform efforts. And the evidence base was really strong. That same kind of impact was shown across a variety of contexts and was shown to be achievable at large scale in large scale implementation. Unfortunately, despite that evidence base, we know that we still have a lot of traditional developmental education. So at the bottom of the screen there, only nine states and systems have what we would consider strong policies related to acceleration and placement. Bruce is gonna define what we mean by that a little bit later. Only four states and systems have been able to approach scale in either area. And again, we'll define what we are, how we define full scale implementation. And only four states and systems have strong policies that support math pathways implementation. So now we're gonna turn it over to Bruce. Thanks, Amy. And as Amy mentioned, you know, the evidence is abundantly clear that these three reforms are not just modestly uh, effective, but extremely effective in moving students through gateway courses, and also with some evidence to show that it accelerates completion. So we did a sort of a back of the envelope sort of thought experiment to try to see well, what does that mean actually if you were to look at this at a national scale. So we pulled together sort of a variety of data to sort of make a projection, I would say a conservative projection of the kind of impact we could have each year. So what we did is we looked at uh, 2019 enrollments as reported by the National Student Clearinghouse. And then we applied two sets of data or two sets of statistics uh, to what might happen if those students were, uh, you know, what would happen in terms of placement and success in gateway courses for those students. Um, so we looked at uh, data from the from Complete College America that they did several years ago. Amy already cited that data. Um, and we also looked at the outcomes that the state of Tennessee has achieved through their scale of developmental education reforms, particularly co-requisite reforms. And what is the difference in terms of overall impact across the country? And not surprisingly, we found that, you know, we could over double uh, the percent of students passing gateway college courses within a single year if we were to scale this reform completely. Um, the first analysis is sort of if we had zero developmental ed reform versus if we fully scaled. So over double, almost 150% increase in the percentage of in the, in the number of students who are passing college gateway courses. And we also have some evidence, as you can see in the bottom of the screen, from CUNY, who have done a longitudinal study and demonstrated that it also has had a positive impact on student completion. So uh, there's no question that these reforms are effective. The question now is simply how do we get them implemented and scaled to as many students as possible? The results, uh, next slide, uh, Julie, are of course for students of color, particularly black students, we see a 170% possible increase if we were to fully scale these reforms uh, across the country. Um, and then for Latinx students, 
about 140%. So there's no question that we need to be implementing these reforms, both in terms of improving outcomes for all students, but in particular for students from minoritized communities. Um, and it's, we're talking about large numbers of students. Yes, go ahead, Julie. So our conversation today is not necessarily focused on what can you do at your own individual institution, but how can you be looking at these reforms from a state or system level? Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, and we'll get into that in some details today. But we're finding that, of course, we not only have evidence that these reforms work, but we know that they, they, they can work at scale. We have several states that are already largely at scale, and in every case, they've seen tremendous improvements in gateway completion. So for that reason, we're challenging folks in the field to think about how they might scale. And you can see here our definition that we're using, which is essentially saying that all students are getting placed in and are completing, have an opportunity to complete their gateway math and English courses aligned to their chosen program of study within their first academic year, and that they're re receiving all the instruction and supports they need to be successful to ma maximize their likelihood of success. So there's ample evidence right now that suggests that almost all students, very little evidence to suggest there's any students who do not benefit from these reforms. And states like California, Texas, Georgia, now Louisiana, Tennessee, have all largely implemented these for reforms for all of the students that are enrolling at their post-secondary institutions. And as a result of that, we're seeing some uh, good evidence on the impact, not only in terms of overall success, but uh, in terms of different populations of students. Of course, one of the barriers to all this is if we don't do this with fidelity. So certainly it's important to have uh, scaled reforms, but we have to implement these reforms with fidelity. And if we don't do so, if we only allow some institutions to do it, or if we don't do it uh, with fidelity across institutions, it will generate inequity. So we're gonna, we're gonna just dig in on that last point a little bit because we think it's so important that, uh, Thinking about what happens when there is not consistent implementation across institutions. So this quote from the California Acceleration Project report, still getting there, really sums it up. We are particularly concerned about the equity implications of uneven implementation across the state as student zip codes continue to determine their access to colleges that have made powerful reforms. And this is a concern because we have found in both California and Texas that when developmental education reforms were not implemented at full scale, minoritized students were the least likely to get access. Now, sadly, that's probably not a surprise because that's how things happen in our systems. But this is what we're trying to work against is to make sure that every student has the opportunity to succeed with evidence-based practices. You can go on to the next one. So one of the other findings in our study is that momentum for dev ed reform seems to be slowing. And this is of course the thing that we're trying, we are all collectively and Strong Start especially are, are trying to halt that, that slide and turn it around. So what we found is that there is backsliding among early implementers. There is a lack of scale in some area in some sites, despite tremendous efforts to implement and quite a few resources spent. Uh, there are states and systems with no efforts to implement at all. And the pandemic had mixed effects. The pandemic actually probably made progress on placement move forward because many institutions had to find other ways to place students other than uh, single standardized assessment. But it slowed implementation of co-requisites. And in some cases, it led us back to that deficit, many people back to that deficit view of students saying, those students are coming in less prepared. We now need to add classes for them. And just a reminder, there is absolutely no evidence that that is an effective strategy. So not to be too negative here, we just wanna really hit the point that we should not assume that progress is, all, is, is inevitable 
And we need to continue really working hard because reversion to past practices is a real threat. And back to Britt. So we began to explore, well, what were sort of the, the key factors that contributed to states uh, scaling these reforms? And we've mentioned the states that we're talking about here. And this is probably not a shock, but uh, having the capacity, both leadership at the system and state level, but also throughout the system, uh, with coalitions of people involved in the reform is essential. You have to build the capacity um, of the systems and you have to have a strong coalition who are in, su in support of reforms. In addition to that, you need to have strong policy. Uh, the bottom line here is for those states that have performed, uh, have moved on developmental education reforms, those that have a strong state or system policy are the ones that are having the most uh, success in terms of scaling the reforms. We've seen all kinds of different combinations of this. We definitely have seen states that have strong policy but have not done the work that they needed to do to support faculty and institutional staff on to design, implement, and get professional learning on how to be uh, effective, to, to deliver effective instruction. But we've also seen some examples where states have put an immense amount of resources into developmental education reform, but have fallen short or have chosen not to implement state or system policy. And that has caused inequitable, um, uneven implementation across the state. So we need to really have both if we're gonna be honest about trying to achieve scale, scale and impacting all the students who can benefit from the reforms. So let's go a little bit deeper into those ideas. There's really three main areas that we found that were really telling in terms of states that were doing uh, positive and scaled work in developmental education. And I already mentioned the importance of strong policy. So what do we mean by that? Well, I'm just, just to be straightforward, we need to think about mandating these reforms. This isn't a nice to have, or it would be good to have thing. Because of the evidence that we have behind them, there's really very little reason that we don't ultimately within states have a policy that says we will be implementing these reforms for all students who would benefit from them. How you get there in terms of the policy, well, that depends. But more importantly, in the end, your end goal, part of your end goal should be, how are we ultimately gonna end with the policy? And when you draft that policy, it's gotta be clear, unambiguous language. We found several policies where they're not clear about what a co-requisite is or what multiple measures are. You have to be explicit. And there's plenty of evidence out there about how to define these reforms, which uh, definitions of these reforms have demonstrated the greatest success. Um, and so there's really no reason not to be specific where the evidence is strong uh, uh, in terms of the definitions of these reforms and how to implement them. Obviously, ideally, you have a policy that provides resources and support and time, right? Um, while we've seen plenty of places uh, implement these reforms quickly, we think it's reasonable when you're talking about scale to give a little bit of time, but not so much time that it sort of falls off to the back burner until you're six months away from when the policy is implemented. So something like one to two years is probably a reasonable amount of time for an institution to develop their plans and, and address the, all the key issues. Um, and then of course, along with that comes support, whether that's financial support, whether that's professional learning and technical assistance, but it's critical to provide those supports. In terms of funding also, if there's some funding incentives, either through outcome-based funding formulas or other ways to incent institutions to implement the form. And then, of course, the importance of data for both accountability and monitoring, but also to drive continuous improvement. We did see several examples of what we would call weak policy that did things like suggest or recommend that institutions implement multiple measures. And they didn't actually define what multiple measures were. They didn't actually clarify to say that high school GPA is really one of the most predictive measures and you should be including that. Um, so we need that clear language and we need to be more assertive in terms of what those reforms look like. All those reforms need to be aligned with the evidence. We've seen many examples where they have not. So ensure that the evidence is there. Um, try to avoid exemptions or opportunities for institutions to sort of avoid implementation if all possible. And of course, uh, many policies had a lack of accountability or oversight or data collection or any kind of process to refine the policy. Next slide. 
So how does this process work? I think the second area, in addition to policy, is the process that you utilize to get to scale in some way, whether that's starting the process with the ultimate goal of policy or starting with policy and then implementation. And I've already mentioned the importance of strong leadership, resources, and data capacity. But the second uh, middle column there really focuses in on getting the right stakeholders around the table, not only for first to help advocate for the reforms, demonstrate that there's a need for it, particularly as it relates to equity, but also to have key stakeholders involved in the design of uh, reforms, design of policy, and to build buy-in from all players, not just faculty, not just institutional staff, but also think about students or even the community at large with, that has implications, particularly when you're talking about equity. Um, and then from there, using that coalition as the entity that works to provide guidance, evaluate the impact, and then oversee institutional implementation and the refinement of policies. So once you have that coalition in place, that builds our capacity for providing technical assistance through that coalition, also a mechanism to drive continuous improvement of policy and practice. Next slide. So that leads us to the, 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 the issue of continuous improvement. So this is, I think, one of the key findings is that the states that are committed to scale um, and have made the most progress to scale um, are not resting on their laurels once they've passed policy or they've done the implementation. They continue to evaluate what they're doing. They look at whether it's being effective. They look for the places where the policy has created loopholes that can allow institutions to circumvent the delivery and deny opportunities for students. And then they go back and they refine their practices and their policies. And so three of the leading states that we know of have all done that. California has actually already amended their state policy because of what they saw in terms of implementation. Tennessee did a thorough study of their implementation and are now looking at refining their policy and practices because of it. And Georgia has done the same. So really an important part of this is the work is really never done, right? There's never a point to say we can clap our hands and say done. We have to continually be committed to continuous improvement, particularly, particularly when we're thinking about generating equitable outcomes for students. So we're going to stop now and have some discussion. So we've covered all four of these topics that you see uh, on the left in the gold, and we want to break you off into groups uh, to uh, address each of these questions. Um, so I think we're allowing people to choose, is that right? Which, which room that you want to be in. So if scale is what you want to talk about, you can join that room. But if you can see right here, we've got the questions for you to, to discuss. We'll post them into the breakout room so you'll have them handy. Um, and we'll just take a few minutes to answer each and every one of those questions that we have right now. So a lot of it has to do about what your state capacity is, what you need in order to be able to scale these reforms, develop policy around the forms, who needs to be involved in at the table, and how you might design the metrics that are important for continuous improvement. So with that, Julie? Yes, I am going to stop my sharing so I can open breakout rooms. Um, there's going to be a lead in each room, like Bruce said, who will post the question. So don't worry about having to memorize it. Um, and you'll get a notification um, as when it's time to leave the breakout room. So feel free to choose whichever one you want to join. The rooms are opening now. As people are coming back, I'm going to share my screen again, unless Bruce and Amy want me to keep it down for a second when we share out. Thank you. I didn't catch what you said, Bruce. Sorry, yeah. I was muted. Uh, we, if you could put up the slides that had the questions, we're actually not going to do a full group share out just because of time. Uh, but if people want to put in chat big ideas that they they heard in their discussion, that would be great. I also want to address Chris's question that came up right before we, we went into breakouts um, about evidence of practices for COREX. Uh, this is not something where I would say we have definitive evidence yet of the best practices. We have some early evidence that um, I think is important to look at. And we do have some resources at the end of the uh, presentation that 
that present some of that. Uh, I would say the biggest thing that I, I see with co-requisite design is the importance of backward design from the, the college course and really designing to meet the college standards versus like just trying to mesh two courses together, which I think we do know that that doesn't work. Uh, so we are going to go ahead and um, continue our discussion. I'm sorry to, to rush to the next thing, but we really wanted to have time for some more discussion later. Um, we really want to make a case, and I will say this is maybe the one slide where this is a little bit of our opinion, like that where Bruce and I are 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 advocating for something based on our opinion um, that we think that dev ed reforms lay the foundation for all other student success reforms. So we talked in our group about that there are a lot of innovations out there. There are some really important reforms like guided pathways. Uh, advising reform, uh, in, improvement of instructional practices. All of those are important. I support all of them. And yet I would say none of them can be fully effective without dev ed reform first. For example, if you have guided pathways, no matter how good your guided pathways are, if a student doesn't get into and complete their gateway, call it gateway math and English, they can never take advantage of it. Your advisors can be the best advisors in the world, but the students are still going to suffer if those advisors are forced to put them into ineffective courses. Strong instructional practices, while important, cannot make up for these long course sequences where students lose time, momentum, the where they have to pay for those courses. So all of those things become more effective when they are layered on top of dev ed reform. Okay, next slide. So we really see that the dev ed reform lays your foundation. And now let's, we wanna talk a little bit about equity because this is kind of complicated. So one of our interviewees in our study said, developmental education is a disabler of equitable learning, something that creates an immediate disadvantage. That is definitely true. We know that dev ed reform puts students at a disadvantage. So getting, or excuse me, not dev ed reform, traditional dev ed. So dev ed reform, helping students get into those college courses more quickly and helping them uh, engage in, in content that matters to them and to be successful at it is going to remove barriers. And it removes barriers that are disproportionately impacting minoritized students. So that's an equity gain. However, we also see some evidence, this is, a, this is where the evidence isn't quite as clear, but there's some evidence that it's not enough, that just having race neutral policy changes, structure changes, uh, is not enough to uh, remove all those barriers for minoritized students. So we see that this is an opportunity to design for equity because you are in the process of redesign. This is the time to really think about what that looks like to work uh, to design for equity. Next slide. So we think about this in these three buckets. This is the potential we have with dev ed reform. First of all, we have the potential to change how higher education thinks. I'm sure you're familiar with the phrase, phrase from college ready students to student ready colleges. That is the heart of dev ed reform that came out of dev ed reform because we are start stopping, we're, we're not looking at students as they have to meet our standards. We're looking at it as we need to meet them. So it's a, it really challenges deeply held beliefs about both students and about institutions and in our role. This is an opportunity to transform how higher education operates. So you heard, I mean, this may sound a little strange because a minute ago, Bruce was advocating for policy, which is very top down in most cases. But remember that point about coalition. 
we can build coalitions around policy to make that policy stronger and make sure that voices are heard that are not traditionally heard. And then at the institutional level, can think about how do we engage people in a way that disrupts our traditional culture and power structure. So an example I like to use here is advisors are often not in the rooms where decisions are made about a lot of uh, reforms, and yet they have critical information and expertise to contribute. So this is an opportunity to disrupt that power structure, put the advisors in there with, with your, your faculty, your administrators, and give everyone equal voice. Put the students in there, get the student experience. And finally, this is a chance to transform the, what we do. We are very, we are a traditional field. We tend to do a lot of things because it's the way we've always done it. But this is an opportunity to really build on saying we are gonna have evidence-based practices. We are gonna tear down silos and think about students and their needs in a holistic way and think about how to serve the entire student. So that's our potential that we see uh, to make this a transformational process. And this really works at the system and the institutional level. I know we have a lot of uh, people from institutions on the call today. So uh, next slide. So we want to have a, a little discussion about this and get your ideas about how you see dev ed reform supporting these transforming ideas. So we're gonna have a jam board and Julie will put that uh, link in the chat. And we have three sheets on the jam board that uh, the first one is about this question in the first column, what are the ways in which developmental education reform can challenge deeply held beliefs and assumptions about students and the role of the institution. The second one has what strategies can be used in the reform process to disrupt academia's hierarchical culture and power structures. And finally, what strategies support institutions to integrate evidence-based student supports and instructional strategies into the redesign of these services and processes? So, we can go, if you'll go to the Jamboard and just start adding uh, post-its wherever you have ideas. I, I encourage you to think very action, be very action oriented. This is a great opportunity to learn from others. You can also comment on each other's uh, uh, posts and then we'll, we'll kind of see what we can, what we get out of the collective wisdom of this group.
book through about another minute on the board, and then we'll have a little discussion. And of course, you can continue to add things as we keep going. Let's just take a few minutes to, to share any thinking uh, as you're looking at this. Maybe let's start on the, the first board. Uh, as you're reading this, did anything stand out to people or something that it triggered a new thought for you? I'm interested in this, this point about giving students the tools and resources to feel empowered. Uh, not to put anybody on the spot, but is, would someone like to say more about that? Like, what does that mean? Uh, what, what kind of tools and resources do you think that would be? So Alina here, um, that is something that I actually put on the Jamboard. Um, I was thinking somewhere along the lines of, you know, self-placement, letting them decide, you know, what their capabilities are of like, you know, what classes they need, if it's, you know, a, a co rec class or, you know, a, a class that supports a class that they would get credit for um, and tools and resources. I mean, you know, like letting them decide of like what they're capable of really. Thank you, Alina. And those are all great things where, again, those advisors are really important, right? And uh, how they're presenting those those kinds of resources. Okay, let's look at the second board. Uh, let me open it up. Anything anyone would like to comment on here or, or ask a question about? Hey, Amy, this is Elizabeth. Um, the one that I'm thinking about that I think is really the, the challenging conversation to have, if we're really honest, is who is benefiting more from our current model? Is it the institution or is it the student? Because we know, uh, particularly in Oregon, you know, the, co the pre prereq is a cash cow. You get students in there and it's a very cheap course to run and students get stuck in that cycle and keep taking it and taking it and taking it. That is such an important question and it's so interesting here. We kind of got it in two different places on the board. Um, and it is tricky. No, you know, it's like the conversation nobody wants to have, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, we don't want to admit that that's what's happening, but if we're honest, that's what's going on. Anybody I, else have I, thoughts I, on that? Like how you've had dealt with that? I'll just quickly comment. I had a conversation with a state leader who was implementing a scaling developmental education reforms recently. And the, he went, the first place he went to uh, were the CFOs before he even went to the presidents. And he made the case to say that you can afford this and said that you can still have your, those courses as co-recs, you still enroll them, you still bring in those resources. But now with these reforms, you have the benefit of retention dollars as well. So this isn't a money loser, this is a money maker. And once he got the CFOs on board, then he had the conversation with the provosts and the presidents. So the presidents wouldn't turn to the CFO and say, can we afford this? And the CFO says no, <laughs> right? Um, so I, I thought that was interesting. That is uh, who, yeah, that's, and again, that's a change from how we would normally do things, right? We would normally go to the presidents first. Okay, let's look at the final board. Mm -hmm. 
lots of things here about incentives, um, support professional development. I like this institution-based learning communities. Uh, I, that's not a strategy I, I think I've heard before. Any other comments people want to make about this? Hey, this is, everybody, this is Chris from Motivate Lab. Um, I think the comment I'll just make is this, it feels like there's a key shift. We talked about this a little bit in our group from like, uh, from, the, from the system level into um, the institutional level and how supports need to shift their foci. So we're, we're like trying to get things structurally changed and then that's like the policy level. And then when you get to the system level, well, what are those supports that need to happen to change things for the people delivering the services? So I did bring that up about learning communities as one way to support people. We know implementation's hard and you fail usually when at first, but there's all those human elements of trying to do something different. And so thinking all those different ways to try to support it has a very local feel to it. That is what might work in one institution might not work in another. Uh, Georgia, I, I was just going to say, Bruce. Georgia uh, organized at the system level something they called Chancellor's Learning Scholars, which were essentially learning communities where they uh, took leading faculty, sort of trained them in the key in the key areas of pedagogical strategy, and then sent them out to their campuses to develop learning communities. So it's something that they did at systemically, rather than just relying on individual institutions to think about ways to create professional learning opportunities on the campus. Well, thank you for all of your uh, contributions on here. It's, it's great to see that people are thinking about these strategies and, uh, and the things that will help us really move towards this equity-minded transformation. I'm especially pleased, and it was on one of the earlier boards about, you know, just seeing how students are, are, people are seeing students as more central to the process than I think we would have seen in past years. Julie, do you want to go to the next slide? This is just a quick um, wrap up, and of course, you're going to get the slides, so you don't need to write all these things down. There are actually a lot of resources out there. It was kind of hard to make a short list. Uh, but I tried to select some resources here that, first of all, are good for either um, kind of doing some implementation, so there's a few tools, but also for case making. Because uh, obviously a lot of this webinar has been around the case making of why it matters that we should be doing these reforms, doing them well, and doing them at scale. So I think you will, uh, if you're looking for something uh, along those lines, some of these will be helpful. And again, feel free to reach out to Bruce or I if there's something else you're looking for. So uh, thank you so much for us. Um, Bruce, I don't know if you want to say anything before we hand it off to Julie. No, I think I'm good. Uh, thanks for being here today. And again, yes, let us know if there's anything we can help you with. All right. Well, I like Bruce and Amy said, you will be getting those resources um, in a follow up email. So no need to capture them all right now. Um, thank you everyone so much for joining and for participating today. And thank you, Amy and Bruce. It was such a privilege to have you leading this session today. Um, we value everyone's feedback and would greatly appreciate it if you'd please take a couple minutes while the experience is fresh to share your thoughts and opinions on today's event. Um, we're using a new feedback survey to better gather information about how to improve these sessions, and you can find that um, at the link in the chat that Maya just put in there. For our next Dev Ed Reform Learning Community session, we will discuss faculty development and equitable instruction. That session will take place on October 19th. In the meantime, uh, we invite you to subscribe to our newsletter if you have not already for updates on these and other events. The link to sign up can also be found um, in the chat and on our website at strongstart.org. Um, if you have any additional questions, please also reach out to Bruce, to Amy, to me, anybody on the Strong Start team, we'd be happy to answer. Um, and thank you again for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again in a future Strong Start to Finish event soon. Take care, everyone.
Bye, everybody.